So we'll start with the intro here. Good morning and welcome everyone to the fourth installment of California Wine Institute's Behind the Wines uh, with our host Elaine Chacon Brown. Another great turnout. So thank you all again for uh, coming out today. So if this is your first time joining us. This is a weekly series featuring a virtual chat and tasting with Elaine and some of California's top winemaking and viticulture talents. As shelter in place continues and events and travel have been postponed, uh, the goal of this series is to bring some news from California's vineyards and wine cellars to our international audience. So today we are thrilled to welcome Jason Haas, partner and general manager at Tablas Creek Vineyard in Paso Robles. So I'm going to begin with some housekeeping reminders for everyone. Uh, first, please make sure your lines are muted. Uh, next, please ensure uh, that you have your Zoom screen set to speaker view. Uh, there's an option to select it in the top right hand corner of your screen. So during the webinar, know that there are two communication methods available to participants that we encourage you to use, a uh, chat section as well as a Q&A se section. So these are different. The chat section is an informal way for you to communicate with other participants, and I see some people using it now. Uh, just be sure to select everyone in the to field uh, because it can default to panelists only. And so then only the panelists will see it. So if you want everyone to see, uh, make sure you do edit that to field. And then there's the Q&A section. So this is important. This is where we'd like you to submit your questions for, uh, for Elaine and Jason to answer towards the end of the webinar. And we'll do our best to answer, address all the questions, but please know that any that are not answered live will be provided in the Q&A summary and the email you will receive following the program. So in this email, we will also provide a list of export markets for the wineries uh, represented. So now I'll turn it over to our host, Elaine, a wine writer and educator. She writes for her own website, Waka Waka Wine Reviews, uh, for jancisrobinson.com as the American specialist and contributes to a long list of respected publications. And Jason, second generation proprietor of Tablas Creek and son of Vineyard Brands owner and Tablas Creek co-founder, Robert Haas, uh, who grew up in the wine business, uh, working at Chateau de Bocastel and moving to California to join Tablas Creek in April of 2002, where he oversees the business, winemaking and sales and marketing. So take it away. Jason, it's so great to have you here. Really, really nice to see you and, and, and great to see you outside in Paso Robles. It is the most beautiful time of year, I think, in, in Paso. Everything's really green and it's warm, it's sunny. Uh, the vines are exploding in growth. It's, it's a nice time to be outside. Well, and I want to make a point of highlighting, too, you've had a really good uh, rain winter there for Paso, too. Yeah, it's, it's actually gone sort of in episodes. We had a good beginning of the winter in November and December, and then a really dry January and February, which are normally our two wettest months. And then we got kind of saved by, by some good rain in, in March and early in April. So um, overall, the totals are a little less than we would norm we get in a normal year, but we had a wet winter last year. And the way that it came this year means that we're, we're pretty optimistic for the, the vines this growing season. It's great. And one of the reasons I wanted to point out how your winter and rainfall has gone is just because it really highlights how different different parts of California are. With this webinar series, we've talked to several people from the North Coast, and the truth is it's been quite a dry winter for us in the North Coast. And then in Southern California, they've had actually an excess of rain, but you're sort of the perfect Goldilocks place there in Paso this year. Yeah, I think the inflection point between above average and below average is the mountains about 10 miles south of us. Mm -hmm. So we're a little below average. You get down to down to even Edna Valley and in San Luis, southern San Luis Obispo County, and they're a little above average. Well, so let's go ahead and place you, um, for people that are not here in California or not as familiar, let's go ahead and look at a map to, to see where you're located there in Tablas Creek and Paso Robles. Katie, could you pull up the California map? So this first map, we're gonna show two different maps today. And this first map is just to be, give a really general sense of where we are in California. So there's the entire state, the Pacific, of course, importantly um, on the left. And if you focus in on the square, the, um, the highlighted dark square there that Katie is showing with the red pointer, you get a sense of that's the part of the central coast that we're looking at right now. So we're gonna zoom into that section where the square is on the second map. 
And now we're, this is a close up there. So you can see this is about two thirds of the way down what we call the central coast of California. The orange box um, is the Paso Robles AVA, which of course now has a whole host of nested AVAs within it as well. And you can see there far into the coastal mountains on the western side of California and the western side of Paso Robles AVA, there's Tablas Creek Vineyard. So Jason, where you're sitting right now is actually nestled in those coastal mountains, right? Yeah, we're at 1500 feet. We're on the eastern slope of the coast range. So if you're on the western slope of the coast range, um, the climate is quite cool and quite foggy. Um, on the eastern slope, it can warm up, but we're only about 10 miles from the Pacific. So we get quite a lot of rain, um, typically two to two and a half times what they get even in the town of Paso Robles, which is 10 miles further east of us. Um, and enough rain to dry farm, which is one of the main reasons that we picked right. this spot 30 years ago. One of the things I love about your story, though, too, is that um, when, you know, when your family started um, Tablas Creek with the Perrin family from France, Paso Robles was profoundly small, uh, less, far, far, far <laughs> less developed. It was not an obvious place for you to go at all. But the effort you put in was to find the right place to fulfill the goals that you had rather than just to go to a known place. And so you spent actually several years looking before you found Paso Robles. Yeah, it was a four year search. Um, and the, the idea behind Paso Robles, behind Tablas Creek was to find a spot that would give us the opportunity to uh, riff on Chateau Neuf du Pop. Um, I mean, our, our partners are the Perron family from Chateau de Beaucastel, who are five generations into the, into the Southern Rhone. My dad was their wa American wine importer. And they, they were looking for the right combination of soils and climate and rainfall that we thought would allow Rhone varieties, particularly Southern Rhone varieties like Grenache and Morvedra and Roussan, to thrive. And my dad was always of the belief that if you had the right raw materials in place, the, the rest was really just a question of perseverance. So mm -hmm. um, the fact that Paso Robles wasn't very well known, there were only about 15 wineries here when we started 30 years ago. Um, that, was, that, that, was, that wasn't the most important thing. The most important thing was that there was limestone, there was good rain, and there was this great long growing season with cold nights and, and ocean influence. Yeah, one of the things people often don't realize about California is that we do have limestone bands through sections and one of the key ones goes from Paso all the way down into Santa Barbara County through that section of the Central Coast. Yeah, right it's one of the only ones actually. It's, right. it's, it's quite rare in California. It's common in a lot of the great wine regions in Europe, but it's, but it's rare here. Well, and one of the other things that I think is really important to highlight is that, you know, it'd be easy to assume that in, in a family from the United States partnering with a family from France, that the family from France would take the lead. But actually there have, as, as you've gotten to know your plot of land there in Paso Robles better, some of your farming techniques have actually gone back and influenced what they do there in Chateauneuf. And one of the, one of the key things that I thought it'd be fun for us to talk about is how you're, you've been doing regenerative farming and bringing animals into the vineyard even. Yeah, I mean, we, we inherit from Bocastel a commitment to organic viticulture. That's something that they, they've been doing since the 1960s. And that was our baseline. Our starting point was, was we were going to farm like them and then see what we felt like we wanted to adjust. Um, and we do this not particularly because um, we're trying to make an organic product. Um, we don't label our wines as organic. The grapes are organic, but the, that, that's not the point. The point is that we feel like farming organically, like dry farming, um, allows us the best chance of expressing the, the terroir of where we are, the character of the place that, that we chose. So um, that led us from organics to biodynamics with its commitment to creating a, an entire farm unit, a complete farm unit that we didn't need to bring in things from the outside. Um, and if you're not bringing in things from the outside, how do you handle soil fertility? Um, and one of the, we, we've been doing composting since the beginning, but um, biodynamics really encourages you to try to create a more complete ecosystem. And one of the things that's lacking in, in most farm ecosystems is animals. Um, so we started out in 2012 with a, a flock of about a dozen sheep that come in and uh, graze the cover crop in the winter. And we keep them moving around and they fertilize with their manure. And um, it was, it was successful and, and kind of fun. Um, so we built up that flock to the point that now we've got about 200 sheep and Katie, could you show us one of those too? 
as Jason's talking. Yeah, so 200 sheep and some alpacas and uh, a, a donkey and a, a llama. See one of our alpacas. And there. they're all His moving Paco. around. And you're all, they're all moving around the vineyard together in different segments, but importantly, just through the winter period, right? Yeah, you can't have them in there once the vines sprout in the spring because they will happily eat the new growth. Right. So, um, yeah, so they move as soon as we finish harvest. Um, they move into the vineyard blocks and um, then we move them every 24 to 48 hours. We have these sets of movable electric fences that enclose an area of about an acre, an acre and a half. Uh, we have a couple of border collies that move the, move the flock around and we keep them moving every day. Um, the, the impact is dramatic. I mean, 200 sheep drop about 800 pounds of manure a day. So you think of the cumulative impact of putting all of that fertility and all of that carbon back into the soil. Um, it has the, obviously there's, there's fertility and nutrition that's going into the soil, but the more you increase the carbon content of your soil, the better its water holding capacity as well, which is a really yeah. critical thing in a place like Paso Robles where it's dry for six months of the year. Well, so and you I wanna really highlight what you just said because it's, it's actually a pretty profound point to make. So one of the things we've learned more recently is that actually it's not only forests that have great carbon holding capacity, but when we allow um, even natural wild grasses to grow through the year, their roots go so deep that there's incredible um, carbon holding that happens there just even in grasses but what you're actually saying is not only are you helping to reduce the carbon load in your area through the allowing the grasses to grow but you're also actually increasing the water retention of the soils by doing that absolutely yeah yeah and this is you think of the the natural processes that created the fertility say in the great plains it was herds of buffalo that were moving around across this vast expanse they were being moved by predators um, but uh, we're trying to keep the predators at bay, so yeah. we're moving them with, moving them with dogs. Uh, but it's the same thing. You, they graze. Um, they don't pull things out by the roots. But they graze, and 80% of that, um, of that carbon in the, the grass is returned through the manure to the soil, right. um, where it builds up over time. And you, you said that you, um, it, you know, their, hoof, their hooves essentially are helping to aerate the soil a little bit. You're avoiding compaction because you're not do, needing to do tractor runs. So there's just massive benefit. And I know when we spoke, um, when we've spoken previously, you said that actually they've started using this practice back at Bocastel as well. Yeah, in Gigondas. Um, yeah. It's, uh, it's really cool to see. Uh, but that's one of the things that I think has been a, a, a characteristic of this partnership from the beginning is that there's, there's a ton of information exchange. It's not like the Perens are silent partners that provided some money at the beginning and, and, and then off we went. Um, we still see them three or four times a year. Um, they come for the blending. They come after harvest. They typically come whenever we're making a big decision. And we're over there. I was there last year. Niels, our winemaker, has been there each year for the last four or five mm -hmm. years. Um, and every time we go, every time we come back, we, we, we come back with new ideas. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of profound differences, too, though. I know, you know, with when anytime somebody invokes the name Chateauneuf de Pop, people immediately think of the, the large stones. You have a really different soil type um, there uh, where you're located in Paso. You're not dealing with these large round stones like they are there. Well, yes, yes and no. Um, so the, the stones sit at the surface in Chateauneuf du Pop. So if you actually do a soil cross-section in Chateauneuf, you have rounded stones at the top. Right. You have a mix of stones and topsoil down for the next four to eight feet. And then below that, you have this calcareous seabed, um, which is the same as the, the soils that you have here. So the vines are basically growing around those rocks, getting their roots down into the, the limestone bedrock. Um, here, we don't have those rocks at the surface and we right. have less topsoil. We've got a foot or two or three of topsoil uh, but then what's underneath that is, is very much the same. Mm -hmm. So it's just the surface quality of the soil that's, that's changed. Yeah. yeah. So let's go ahead and start looking at wines because we want to keep this conversation going. But also the, um, this first wine um, that we're going to talk about, Katie, if you could pull up the wine slide. The um, first one we're going to talk about really gets at one of the important features of what you do at Tablas Creek, and that is um, blending and working with different varieties, obviously uh, Rhone-based varieties primarily. But so could, Jason, could you go ahead and tell us about the Esprit de Tablas Red that we're tasting together? Sure. Um, so 
we do, we're mostly a blend house. Um, we inherit that from Beaucastel. I mean, Chateau Nip du Pop is, is blending country. Um, and we came here with the idea that we were going to be making Chateau Nip du Pop style blends. Um, it turned out that our initial idea, which was to make one blend of red and one blend of white didn't give us the flexibility to make the best wines that we could. So we now have different tiers of blends that we've developed. The Esprit de Tablas is our top. That's the, it's our flagship. Um, and like the, the Bocastel Red, it's based on Morvedra. Um, and then we blend in the best lots of Grenache and Syrah and Cunois as well. So the blend is not a set thing that, that stays the same every year. It's, it varies depending on what the vintage gives us and what the character is of the lead grape, but it's always led by Morvedra. Um, the percentages have been anywhere from 35 to 57% Morvedra over the years. Um, and then sometimes Grenache is the number two or sometimes Syrah is the number two. It depends on the character of the vintage and the character of the Morvedra. Mm -hmm. It's such, I, this 17, it's a fantastic wine. I love, there's this real um, zesty, energetic presence to it. But what, you know, one of the things, um, when I was there visiting you in October of 18, we were able to taste some older vintages too, which was fantastic. It's really, it's really an incredible aging wine. Um, and one of the things that ha I think has developed recently in wine culture is we've started to think of kind of single vineyard and single variety wines as sort of the, as, as sort of top tier, as if, you know, the finest wines in the world are, are a single variety, a single vineyard. And the work that you're doing is single vineyard, but it's also, um, is also a blend of varieties. And I think it's important to remember that this sort of focus on single varieties is actually really relatively recent in the world of wine. And what you're doing is this long-standing tradition with blending. And I think one of the important parts of the conversation with that is just the notion of completeness. What is, um, you know, what is completeness in wine? So can you speak that, to that a little bit in relation to how you think about blending there at Tablas? Yeah, so um, the, what you say is definitely true about California wine, where mm -hmm. the focus on, on single varietals is a relatively new thing. I mean, people, this is a very much an international audience here. So, I mean, they're well aware, I'm sure, that places like Bordeaux or Chateau Neuf du Pape are traditionally places where wines are blended, where each grape brings something to the table, but you're making, you're making a wine which pulls out the best characteristics of a number of different grapes. Um, and in lessening the signature of any one grape, we feel like also tends to do a, a really good job of bringing out the character of the place that all of those grapes may share. Um, so when we, when we go into um, our blending process, the first thing that we do is we evaluate all of the lots um, blind by just for, for quality. Um, and our top grade is not necessarily the biggest or the most powerful of, of the lots. It's the lots that we feel like are the most expressive. So um, we're choosing lots that we feel like express the character of the variety, the character of the vintage, the character of the place. Um, and then we're blending in other varieties to that lead variety based on how they're going to contribute to the whole, not based just on how powerful is this Syrah or how, right, right. Um, how juicy is this Grenache. Um, we're looking for specific things that are going to complement the character of the lead grape in the particular vintage. Um, so, for example, in 2017, Morvedra was very uh, luscious, but also had really nice structure. Um, so that meant that we felt like we didn't need quite as much Syrah, which normally brings power and structure to the wine, uh, but Grenache, which brings juiciness and vibrancy and good acids, mm -hmm. was really valuable. Um, the challenge was different the year before. If people were to taste the 2016 vintage of this, that was a year where the Syrah was absolutely spectacular. And um, the Morvedra was pretty and juicy and friendly. And we ended up flipping the Grenache and the Syrah percentages. So we ended up with quite a bit more Syrah than Grenache because that was what the Morvedra needed to be its best in 2016. So it's, not, it's never the same, right. it's never the same question. Right, right. It's very vintage, vintage driven. So one of the things, though, you're highlighting that this is a Morvedra led blend, and Beaucastel, of course, is also going with a Morvedra led blend. Are there, are there key differences or challenges that you've seen working with Morvedra here in Paso versus what what they understand there? So um, Morvedra is. I think really well suited to both places. Um, I mean, we picked our spot to grow Morvedra and Roussan 
more than any other grapes. And that was, mm -hmm. that, that was what we were looking for. And I think we were right. Um, the challenge, biggest challenge here with Morvedra is that it's a very late ripener. And so um, that's not a problem in and of itself. I mean, generally the longer the ripening cycle, if you can get it ripe, the better. But this is a really pretty high stress environment for vines in the summer. We get less rain than they do in Chateauneuf. The daily swing in temperature between the daytime high and the nighttime low is quite a bit higher because- Well, and you mean less rain in, in summer. I just want to clarify that too, that, that there's a difference there. When we say less rain, right. we mean that California is dry in the summer and France is not necessarily dry in the summer. Yeah, the, the, the yeah. rain, we get the same, roughly <laughs> the same 25 inches of rain a year here at Tablas Creek as they get in Chateau Nifty Pop. But theirs is not equally distributed every month, but fairly equally. They get a little less rain in the, in the late summer and early fall, a little more rain in the winter. Whereas here we get basically no rain all summer between May and October, it doesn't rain here. And then we get our full annual total of rain in the winter. So um, that means that even with dry farming, even with training the roots of the vines to go down 10, 15 feet to where there is moisture year round, it's still a really high stress environment for the vines, particularly by the time you get to September and October and it hasn't rained in four or five months. So a lot of what we're having to do is just keep the Morvedra and the other late ripening grapes going, um, kind of baby them along the growing season as much as we can. We have to be very careful about yields on those late ripening grapes. Uh, we have to be very careful with how we build the canopy to provide right. uh, some, uh, some shade so we don't end up with sunburn. Um, and if we do that, it works great. But it's, that's the biggest difference is that it's a bit of a higher right. environment. So one of the key things that, that Tablas Creek has done and has really made a profound uh, difference in the state of California wine in general is you've brought in 10 different um, varieties that were not in the state of California before Tablas Creek brought them in. But even in a whole host of other varieties, you actually brought in entirely new um, clonal material, plant material. And so the kind of vine library that Tablas Creek has made possible for the state of California has had a huge impact on improving vine qual or wine quality, but also um, kind of wine diversity. And so for the second wine, we're actually going to looking at one of the more unusual um, varieties that you brought in. And so Katie, can you pull up that wine slide? And then at the same time, Jason, tell us about this wine. I'm really excited that we're going to talk about it. So we decided, um, in our, in our initial round of imports back in 1989, we focused on the main grapes from the Bocastel estate. So that was Morvedra, Grenache, Syrah, Cunoise on the red side, Roussan, Marsan, Viognier, and Grenache Blanc on the white side. Uh, but we had enough success with some of the, these lesser known grapes like Grenache Blanc, like Cunoise, that in 2003, we decided that we should, we should complete the collection and get the rest of the Chateauneuf varieties that we hadn't yet brought in. Um, it's one of the things that makes Bocastel kind of unique and, and, and renowned is that they have all of the Chateau Neuf du Pape varieties in the vineyard there. And that's a result of Jacques Perrin's work in the 1950s to go out and find where these varieties survive phylloxera, bring them back, regenerate them in the vineyards of Bocastel and see how they did. Um, so that meant we brought in some things that that are somewhat known, like uh, Claret and Picpool and Senso, but it also meant that we got to work with some grapes that really are barely known at all. So mm -hmm. Picardin is one of those. Uh, we planted half an acre of Picardin in 2013 after waiting for it in quarantine for seven years. Um, and the half acre that we planted increased the world's footprint by 40%. Which is amazing, you know? So. Picardin, you know, ha, it, in France, because again, we're, there are rain differences um, in France and during the growing season. And so it, it suffers um, uh, powdery mildew um, or odium as they call it. And, and so it's challenging to grow, basically can get rot relatively easily in a wet environment. But of course the Mediterranean climate of California suits that quite well and mostly avoids the problem. And so it's a great example of how a variety could be reaching obscurity in the place it originated, but actually be quite exciting when planted somewhere else like Paso. I love, there's just this really um, wonderful balance of sort of presence intensity and lightness. There's like so much energy and um, zesty brightness, you know, which is an unusual combination to find in this wine. 
And so could you go ahead and tell us what are the 10 varieties that you brought in that hadn't been in California until oh you- Oh boy. Um, okay. So that included uh, Grenache Blanc and Cunoise from the, the initial planting, plus two grapes that came along as stowaways, Vermentino and Tanat. Um, and I love this. So the nursery that you were working with in France, you put, put in your order and they decided, oh, you know, they need, they need these other two varieties. Those will do well in California and sent them along, even though you didn't ask for them. They didn't, they, not only did we not ask for them, they didn't tell us. <laughs> so they didn't tell us, they didn't tell the parents, they just showed up. The first that we knew was when we got, we got a bill from the U.S. Department of Agriculture for the virus testing of Tanat and Vermentino and called them up and said that you're making a mistake. Like these aren't our grapes. But again, they did not exist in the state of California. And Vermentino yeah. now is quickly becoming one of California's popular white varieties. But it was yeah. sent in because a rogue nurseryman in France decided it must be here. <laughs> he, he decided that it would do well in Paso Robles and we yeah. should plant it. Um, and it's, it, he was right. It's, it's done great. So it's those four. Um, and then six varieties in this last round of imports. So Morbelanc, um, Clarette Blanche, Terre Noir, Picardin, Muscardin, and Vacarez. So six and of again, seven. And then again, to repeat, you also, Grenache Blanc, you were the first to bring in. And what were the other? Cunois, you were the first to bring in. And the other two? Tanat and Vermentino. Tanat and Vermentino, right. Yeah. yeah. Um, so um, we, we brought these in, the first round we brought in because we just, we wanted to know that we were starting with top quality clones. There were Rhone varieties in California. Um, but nobody knew the provenance of the vines, and we were convinced that some of them were maybe not the highest quality clones. Um, we didn't want to wonder if we were making tasting differences between the wines that we were making here and the wines that we were used to from Chateau Nifty Pop because the vines themselves were different. We wanted to know that if there were differences, it was because of soils or climate or rainfall or choices that we were making. Um, so, and then it sort of grew naturally from there that we were excited with how well some of these obscure varieties did here and realized that the reason why a grape may have become unpopular um, in, in France may not have anything much to do with what the quality is of the, the wine that it can produce in a place like California. I mean, you mentioned uh, Picardin's susceptibility to powdery mildew. I mean, that was a big deal in the 19th century. Yeah, yeah. Not a big deal now. So um, the, the, a lot of these varieties tend to be these brighter, higher acid, zestier varieties, which again, those became unpopular in a period where people were trying to make right more fruit dense wines. Yeah, yeah. Um, so having these having these in our our toolkit that we get to experiment with um, has been has been a real treat, and it's it's been kind of a a piece of our model from the beginning to try to encourage the spread of these yeah. around around the state and around the country um, and watch what other people have, have been able to do with these varieties that, that we love and that we brought in. Well, cause I know for me traveling around uh, as I do in normal times to wineries outside of California, all over the U S and even elsewhere, um, your, your bringing vines into California has, has moved throughout the United States actually. And so, you know, so I'll, I'll go to other States to taste uh, Rhone based wines and they'll, and I'll ask what's your clonal material and it'll be Tablas Creek selection, you know? So just to make, just to really emphasize what a big effort it is to bring these varieties in. Could you just quickly tell us when did you start bringing them in and when were you finally able to get vines out of quarantine and start planting Tablas for the first time? So um, it, it depends, um, is the answer. So we yeah. started um, in 1989, we brought them into the, the quarantine process and it's a three year quarantine. It was a three year quarantine when we started assuming that they didn't find any virus. If they did find virus, then they would need to clean it up, which is another year of cleanup. And then they have to start a new testing protocol. So um, they've, the technology has gotten better in the intervening years now. Um, they're doing this up at UC Davis and it's only a two year testing protocol, but it's still, if you fail that, it's a year of cleanup and two more years of testing. So um, if you think of something like this Picardin that we're trying, um, we brought that in in 2003. Um, it failed the first round of testing. So it had to be cleaned up. Mm -hmm. It had to be tested again, failed that one, had to be tested again. So we got it after eight years of quarantine. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the, the effort, again, you have to get the cuttings, bring them here, put them in quarantine, just wait the three years, test them, and then possibly keep waiting 
quite a bit longer. So, so and I, think, I think, and then when, uh, when they come out, it's not like you bring in the thousands of vines you need to plant. You're allowed to bring in six cuttings into the quarantine right. process. So even once you get the vines out of quarantine, you've then got to propagate them until you have enough to start planting. So that, there's, that's another couple of years on the back end. Do you know, has anyone else in California planted Pickerton yet? Um, yes, I know that there's a little bit um, in Lodi that Acquiesce Winery right. got. And I know that we've sold some cuttings to a vineyard down outside of San Diego. Um, and there's some in Texas, of all places. Um, and there's probably a few others. We don't necessarily, yeah. I mean, unless somebody tells us um, the way the way that the, yeah. the nursery that we partner with to do the, the grapevine sales works is that unless we ask, we don't necessarily know everywhere where it's gone, but those are some that I'm aware of. Okay, so one of the things that, that you've also done, um, and again, we've alluded to has made a really big impact on California wine is you're not only bringing the cuttings in for yourself, you're actually bringing them in to make them available for other people. And so when I asked if you would pick a wine from another producer, you actually chose to pick one um, from a producer who used cuttings that they got uh, from your family from Tablas Creek and um, and established their own vineyard. So could you, Katie, could you show us the wine slide and Jason, could you tell us about the third wine? Um, so yes, so there's a bunch of reasons why I wanted to pick the this Linguist family Grenache. Um, first of all, it's a beautiful wine. I love what Bob Linguist does with Grenache. He makes wines that have um, this, this kind of translucency and brilliance to them that I think is, is always really pretty. Um, but this is from the, the Sawyer Linquist Vineyard, which is planted, this Grenache is a Tablas Creek clone. Um, and Bob is, a, is one of the, the real pioneers of the Rhone Rangers movement that, uh, that we're a part of. And to the point that um, he was actually one of the people who helped show my dad and Jean-Pierre Perrin around when they were looking for property back in, back in the late 80s. So lots of connections, current and, and, and past to, to Bob and his wines. Yes, so we, I'm very excited to say we actually have a special guest here today. And um, we, when we called Bob to see if we could showcase his wine, he, um, he also graciously agreed to appear here. So hello, I'm so hi, happy to hi, see hi, you. Hi, hello, friend. So nice what it, one of the things I want to make sure people understand is that you are actually, have, you've returned to your, to your roots, to how you got started in wine to begin with and have um, launched Linquist Family Wines focusing on, on Rhone. And so we're actually getting to talk today about, about the Grenache, again, from a vineyard you planted, Sawyer Linquist there in Edna Valley. Yeah, the, the Edna Valley is uh, one of the cool growing areas of the South Central Coast and just an ideal spot for, it's actually an area that's best known for Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, but Rome varieties do great there, just like they do in the Santa Maria Valley and the Santa Rita Hills, which, which are areas that are best known for Chardonnay and Pinot Noir as well. Well, and I, lo I love that, making that point that, you know, sometimes we, you know, Chardonnay and Pinot Noir are so well known and so popular that we can sometimes think, oh, the region's just meant for those. But actually, there's a lot of overlap with, um, with Rhone varieties doing quite well in, in these regions. Katie, could we pull up the map again so we can highlight where Edna Valley is and then also where Sawyer Linquist Vineyard is located? Um, I just want to point out, Katie has made all of these maps custom specifically for this webinar and I really want to thank her for doing that. So again, we're looking at the central coast of California. We're about two thirds of the way down the central coast. You can see where Tablas Creek is located there in the um, coastal range of Paso Robles AVA. And then about 30 miles south of there, there's Edna Valley. Again, hugged, hugged against the coast um, there in the mountains. And Sawyer Linquist there is on the eastern side of the Edna Valley AVA. So um, Bob, could you go ahead and tell us a little more about that area and the vineyard itself? Yeah, sure. Well, you can see that ridge of mountains on the, on the, the slide there. And, and Jason was talking about the, the western side of that ridge and the eastern side of that ridge. And this is obviously on the western side of that ridge. And if you look to the, to the left or to the west of, of the Edna Valley, it's just open to the ocean. Um, there's very little blocking. In fact, most of our uh, influence comes down from Morro Bay, which is that area kind of just to the northwest of the Edna Valley. Um, our closest ocean is at Pismo Beach, which is about five miles away. And uh, it just, it keeps it cool 
during the summer. It's kind of a, we have kind of this phenomenon where in the summertime when it heats up inland, it pulls in coolness off the ocean. The Pacific Ocean is, is, is a very cool body of water and it, it kind of acts as our natural air conditioning during the summer months. Um, and then during the spring and fall, when it's not as hot inland, uh, we tend to have really nice warm spring and really nice warm fall. So uh, we have this ideal growing season for Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, long, cool summer, and then ideal conditions in the fall, warm September, October for the Rhone varieties and other late ripening varieties as well. Mm -hmm. But notice too that the two vineyards are only about 30 miles apart, but actually incredibly different growing conditions. Yeah, on a, on, a, on a normal summer day, if it's 85 degrees at Tablas Creek, it's probably going to be 72 in the Edna Valley, that kind of, you know, that kind of difference. It, 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 and, and then at night, Tablas Creek will drop down to, you know, probably 48 or 50. And where we are, because we're a little closer to the ocean, it'll drop down to, say, 52 or 54. I mean, that's kind of a typical right. summer day, uh, temperature-wise. Well, and again, I want to I want to repeat something that Jason said. You know, so in '89, the Prin family and um, and the Haas family are driving around California together, trying to figure out where they can start an entirely new Rhone project, and uh, and they want to find someone that know, knows his stuff, already knows winemaking and wine growing in California, and so they get in the car with Bob Linquist, who had started Coupe. What year did you start Coupe again? I started Coupe in 1982, and so by 1989, when Bob Haas and, and uh, uh, Jean-Pierre and Francois uh, Perrin started to look at, at areas in California, they contacted me because, and, and I had met Bob, uh, Jason's father, somewhere along the way at a tasting, and, and we kind of hit it off, and, and so he called me, and he knew I was making Syrah, Morved, Viognier, and Marsan at that time. And uh, they wanted to look at Santa Barbara County and also San Luis Obispo County, you know, to kind of scope out different areas to, uh, uh, to, to buy some land and start their project. And they were actually very close to purchasing some property in the Ballard Canyon area of the San Inez Valley. Which, of um, course, has emerged as a, as a lovely Syrah region. And, you know, and really great growing area, area best well. known for Syrah, exactly. Yeah. And at that time was not known for, for much of anything uh, other than the fact that it had a limestone deposit in the soil right. and, uh, and you know, it was making some good wines, but not, nothing in the Rhone realm yet. Well, and so. really just to highlight the time period we're talking about, Ballard Canyon had two, maybe three vineyards in it. Um, yeah. You know, Cal Rhone plant, growing Rhone varieties in California was really rare. Those that existed really were mostly in field blend with, uh, with Zinfandel and Petit Syrah. They weren't planted on their own like we're talking about now. So, the, so Bob, you know, the work that you started with Coupe, like you were a forerunner, truly a forerunner in this whole Rhone movement that's emerged in California. And then you helped bring in, a, you know, a, the next stage of Pioneer with um, the Tablas Creek collaboration by, by this effort of driving them around, you know, which is... Yeah, yeah, no, it was, it was really fun and, and, and actually quite an honor. They, they ended up not settling on, on Ballard Canyon because they were, they were concerned that Morved, which, wanted, which was going to be their lead red variety, uh, might not ripen there consistently. Right, because right. Kind of it's the, so late, the, yeah. It's the latest, it, it requires the most heat. And so yeah. they settled on Paso Robles instead. And I think that was a, obviously a great decision. Yeah. So Jason, though, I, I, it's, so, it's thrilling to get two producers like you together. And so I really want to hear what, it, you know, what do you want to ask Bob? Um, well, I haven't heard all that much about what that, uh, what that car ride was like. Um, <laughs> what, uh, so what, uh, what, how much direction did they give you? And how much were they just saying, take us cool places? Well, even, even though uh, Jean-Pierre is a, at least a head taller than your father, your father always got shotgun out of respect <laughs> for him. <laughs> but uh, basically, we just we drove around uh, the San Inez Valley looking at different sites. And I was already growing some Syrah, uh, Morved, Viognier, and Marsan in, in Los Olivos area. So we looked at that. And actually, you got some cuttings of the Marsan from us, which I think you still have planted at Tablas Creek today. Uh, which are cuttings I actually got from Randall Graham you know, a few years prior to that. So the, in, the, in the small world of how these things happen. 
but uh, uh, I remember going to lunch with, we, we, we spent two days together and both, both days we ended up uh, in Santa Maria for lunch and one day we went for sushi. And of course, Jean-Pierre and Francois had no idea what to do with sushi. Your father who's eaten all over the world knew exactly what to do with sushi and really enjoyed it. And then the next day we went for tacos at a Mexican restaurant in Santa Maria and Jean-Pierre, <laughs> Jean-Pierre and Francois were again at a loss, but they, they enjoyed it. And I brought bottles of wine along each time. We had, had a couple glasses of wine with lunch and got to know each other. And yeah, it was a really uh, formative. It was, it was an honor for me to be able to show them around and it was very formative in my early years of uh, Rhone exploration as well. That's I just, cool. I just love the synchronicity of that, you know, that it, you know, an experience like that ends up being formative for the work you're doing already in California and then in return becomes formative for this collaboration between a family from France and a, and a family from the United States. It's pretty exactly. amazing. And then 31 years later, I'm having yeah. picking them for breakfast for the first time. <laughs> That's great. So Bob, think, what other, oh, go ahead, Jason. I, I, I would say that I think it is, it's absolutely characteristic of the Rhone movement in California that it is this collaborative. Yeah. Um, I think all of us feel a little bit like we're still trying to just carve out enough recognition for the category that we're a part of, that none of us really feel like we're competing against each other. Yeah. We feel like all of us are, are much, better, uh, much better off if we work together to spread the word about, about this family of grapes and, and how well suited it is for California. So it's not like there was this isolated uh, collaboration 31 years ago and and now we're trying to fight to get each other's uh, each other's shelf space it's just not the way that the movement the movement works and has developed even though it's grown and there's now over a thousand producers of Rhone varieties in California and it's it's a much bigger part of the world it still has this very um, kind of uh, all for one one for all mentality I feel like that's a global that's a global thing like it's so indicative of how that works here in California you know and just like what the work that you've done Jason with um, at Tablas with sharing, you know, sharing cuttings and information and, and, and the tastings that Roan Rangers are always doing, they're always collaborative tastings. But then there's so much excitement too, you know, so Hospice to Roan is a great example of, a, of an event. Like, you know, Roan wines obviously start in, in France, but the truth is that these French producers are so excited about what's happening in California and there's this real sense of mutual inspiration that's so exciting to see. Um, yeah, so, a lot of the, uh, oh, sorry. A, no, a lot of, oh, just a lot of the winemakers from the Rhone who have come over for Hospice to Rhone have actually brought back ideas to the Rhone Valley that they've learned in California. That, that's how, I, I, it's been, so it's been a real goes around, comes around. In fact, there was in the Northern Rhone, Roussan was kind of fading away. There was, Marsan was taking over as the, as, as the white variety of, of those great Appalachians in the Northern Rhone. And through uh, success with Roussan as a variety here in California, more and more of the younger generation of Rhone winemakers started growing Roussan or, or replanting Roussan or uh, kind of reinventing Roussan in the nor Northern Rhone, which has really been fun to, to watch. Yeah, no, I really, I really love seeing that. So just briefly, Bob, could you tell us what other varieties you planted in? Sorry, Linquist, you, you mentioned just now the varieties you had planted in San Ynez Valley, but what else did you put in at Sawyer Linquist? So, so Syrah is the dominant variety that we have growing there. And we have Grenache as well. And then my wife, Louisa, is a winemaker as well. She makes mm -hmm. Albarino and Tempranillo. So we have both of those and they, they do great there. And then we have a little bit of Marsan and a little bit of Viognier. Oh, and a little bit of Pinot Noir. Which, which is kind of fun to, to be that? able to yeah. We have a, yeah, I know, a little bit of Pinot. Well, they, we planted the vineyard in 2005, the year right after Sideways. And so it just, it didn't make sense to plant a vineyard in the Edna Valley, which was known for Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, the year after Sideways without planting at least a little bit. So we, 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 make, we mostly just make it to drink ourselves, but uh, uh, it's, it's really good stuff. I just think it's such a great reminder, though, as I said already, that, you know, in a region known for certain varieties, there's actually a lot of range that can can be possible. And so, you know, your inspiration with Spanish varieties on, you know, your wife's side and, and Rhone varieties on your side, it's exciting to see how they can grow in similar places and, and do really quite well. Yeah, um, that's, that's California. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
Um, so I'm so grateful to both of you for making time today. It's really, really fun to get you together. And, I, and I'm really thrilled to taste and talk through the wine. So thank you so much for making time today. And thank you again to everybody. We have had people from all over the world, more than 20 countries dialed in. And again, many of them in the middle of the night. And so thank you to everyone from all over the world for joining us today. I hope you've enjoyed um, today's session. It's a thrill to have both Bob and Jason here today. Thanks, Elaine. Good to thank see you, everybody. Jim. Thank you, Elaine. Thank you. Thank you, attendees. Um, thank you, Wine Institute. Yeah, exactly. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Elaine. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Jason. Uh, and thanks to all our attendees. Uh, so we're actually wrapping up our, our four episode series um, and our focus in April um, with Down to Earth Month was on farming, sustainability, and, you know, because it's been uh, quite successful, uh, we want to continue this series. So we're very excited uh, to say that we'll be continuing through the month of May, and we'll be diving into some new topics, starting with Hardy Wallace, uh, owner and winemaker at Dirty and Rowdy Family Wines, uh, next week on May 5th, Tuesday, at 10 a.m. Pacific. So... And I'm going to I'm going to give viewers today an advanced uh, insight that we will also have a special guest, Steve Edmonds, appearing briefly Ooh, in that episode. Cool. Oh, nice! Beautiful. Steve's I just love that you have more Vedra specialists on in, on consecutive weeks, <laughs> like we're taking <laughs> yeah. over. Yeah, respect. <laughs> so thank you again to everybody. It's, it's really it's really been an honor and and quite special to in the midst of everything else going on to be able to feel connected to people all over the world and to kind of share a bit of California with all of you. So thank you again, everyone that's that's been tuning in and I'm really um, honored and grateful to be able to host all of you with these incredible producers from California. Thank you. Thank you, Elaine. Cheers, thank everybody. You. Cheers. Cheers. Mm -hmm.